Evening and welcome to this evening's uh, Ask the Farmer Q&A session. My name is Bridget Barry and I coordinate Farming for Nature. Farming for Nature was set up to inspire and encourage farmers that farm or wish to farm more for nature. And one of the ways we do this is finding exemplary farmers each year that do this in practice. And this Q&A session is a great way to hear from these farmers. So I'll kickstart the uh, session tonight by asking our guest speaker a few questions. And then if anyone has any questions, just write it in their chat box, box at, on your banner and I'll facilitate them as we go along. Um, if you miss any of the session or if you know of anyone that would like to see it, it will be up on our YouTube channel by uh, tomorrow afternoon. So feel free to share it or look it up and, and share it. That would be great. So on to tonight's session, we're delighted to have Morris DC join us um, from Northwest Tipperary. Uh, Morris farms in partnership with his father, Rory, there. Uh, it's a 120 acre mix farm, uh, sheep and tillage, under sheep and tillage. Uh, Morris, welcome and thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you very much. Um, so, Morris, you, you're another new one for us, I suppose, because you're, you're both a farm and a brewery. Um, so we'll get into that a bit more in a while. But before we do, you might just tell me about your own journey onto this farm and farming. Okay. How long do we have? Uh, <laughs> if... Yeah, I, I was considering it as someone asked me this previously. Um, and, you know, I would have grown up on the farm. My dad always farmed, my granddad farmed. Um, and actually the journey into farming kind of was always sort of there. Although actually from a very young age, I always, my dad always said, he's like, farming is great, but, you know, go and get a degree. So actually I went and I got a degree in engineering. Um, and I still work in engineering as well, actually, just to make my life complicated. Um, but it, but there was, there is actually, a, there's a kind of a message in it in that my dad knew the writing on the wall for agriculture and the returns in that when he was young, you could make a good living from farming. And that was diminishing. And so much to the extent that he said to his son, you know, I, I love that you love the idea of going farming, but just in case, you know, things aren't looking positive, the trend is downwards. So, you know, go get something else as a just in case. Um, and that, that also to me, the other little sort of how did I get into it? How did I get into conservation agriculture and sort of the journey that I kind of went on in terms of agriculture yeah, is sure. like, I remember my dad, it was at harvest and it was actually in a field on my grandfather's farm. And this had been maybe 40, 50 years in continuous spring barley tillage. Um, and I remember him kind of pulling his hair out going, I, I did everything right. You know, why are the yields poor? Like what's, you know, I did everything by the book. I didn't skimp on anything, you know, and why aren't the yields there? Um, and that kind of got me, it was another article after that where there was a guy, there was a professor from Chagas who was discussing soil carbon. And he was talking about the incremental increases in varietal yield. So every, every couple of years, there's a new variety of barley or wheat comes out and it's like, you know, 2% more efficient, you know, higher yield. But he was making the point, if we added all of those 2% for every variety that came out over the last 50 years, we'd be on 15 tons to the acre. But that's mm. not what happens, you know, and he was making the point, what's what's limiting it? It's, and he was making the point about soil carbon, actually. And this was way before climate change and everything. But that kind of started that little question that I, I didn't know how to answer, um, which Years down the line, a couple of things clicked into play. You know, we set up a brewery with a couple of mates and my brother. Um, and that was all on the, as when we're crop farmers, like we're arable farmers, I try not to say tillage because mm -hmm. I'm trying to reduce tillage. So we're arable, we produce crops and all of that is sold in the world market. And basically we just take the world market prices and that's that. And that's we used to produce. We used to produce solely malting barley, basically, and um, which would find its way into a pint of black stuff, basically. And um, but in one year they wiped it out, basically, and they stopped buying all the grain from the farm, and um, because asset stripping, centralization of production, and lo and behold, because it's the world market, it's cheaper to import it than to grow it and also Irish farmers are loud and they're cantankerous and they complain that the barley is only worth a penny in the pint why don't you give us 1.1 pennies in the pint and we'd be very happy and we protest and we do all of that so it's easier to put us out of business than to deal with us basically 
Um, so that was, we had to diversify and we brought in crop rotation as part of that because no longer molten barley. So what do you do? We did winter barley, winter oats. We grew some oil seed rape, a little, you know, a few different crops along the way. Um, and we toyed with minimum tillage at one stage and then kind of got back out of it. Um, but yeah, and then, so how getting into the brewing was more about how do we get out of the commodity market and how do we start doing something that we can sell to people and mm -hmm. not just trade it on the world market? And, you know, I just imagine those traders trading ones and zeros. And, you know, that's what literally happens. Like this is uh, the price of our grain gets set on, by Paris and trading and all this like mad stuff, like which the war in Ukraine, like it's like it just blew up the prices. And that's because the commodity and everything. And. To me, like what's what always got me about that is that pretty much every year we do the same. Mm -hmm. We have the same fields and we do the same things of, of planting, of, of harvesting. And yet some years you make diddly squat and some years you make money. Do you know? And it's like literally you just fluctuate. So that's my whole thought is if we can produce something and sell it to people, maybe we could get a consistent, hey, you know, here's here's the beer. It's the same beer as last year you know, plus or minus the season. Do you want to pay the same amount for it? And they go, yeah, that, that would make sense to me. Do you know, mm -hmm. so we're not out of that fluctuation, out of that kind of bust and boom cycle and create, get into a more local grain system, basically. Um, so that's set up the brewery to see, could we do it? Could we brew? Could we be, could we make nice beer? And then from there, we started doing malting um, molding our own grain. And from there I got into heritage crops. And then along the way I joined Base Ireland. I figured out about or learned about conservation agriculture. And now, yeah, it's a whole different world basically. And here you are. Yeah. And um, talking to a lot of people on, on Zoom. And, uh... <laughs> it's great. Just to go back on a few things there, a few points you made. Um I, I like that you know you, you didn't want to rely on the kind of instability of the world markets. Are you a hundred percent you do your does your um, grains 100% go to your beer or are you still selling on the market at all? Yeah, yeah. No, no, like only a small percentage of our of our grains go into the brewery. Um, so we're still in the commodity market, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's, it's it's lovely when it's up, it's terrible when it's down and that's the, that's the game basically. But I'd like to try and reduce my exposure to it. Do you know, mm -hmm. that's the, I, I don't think we'll ever, we'll never produce, put all our grain through the brewery. Mm -hmm. um, but even it shouldn't because a diverse crop rotation should be at least, you know, grain crop, break crop, and spring barley should only be like one in four. Mm -hmm. So therefore we have three other crops that need to have a market different to the brewery. Now okay. we can use wheat, we can use oats, we can use rye, um, which we do. So I'm, I'm trying to get more crops and more and beans is is beans and we're growing some oil seed rape this year as well. And um, so get more of those crops. And ideally, I, I would love for more and more of those crops to be going into human consumption. And mm -hmm. um, so actually, if I have one suggestion for the listeners, it would be if you're into grain, listen to Farmerama. There's a podcast series called Cereal. And it explains all about grain, and it's kind of inspired me to grow more that wheat. cereal with a C, I'm going to say, not with an S, because I know there's a famous yeah. one with an S. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Which is a murder. <laughs> yeah. It, in, in my world, I'm like, no, why? Why, why do we yeah, about yeah, murder? Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, about grain. It's way more interesting. And fun. <laughs> um, it yeah, cereal with a C. Um, yeah. It, but it explains about wheat and flour and bread and why the bread is the way it is and why the mills, the bakers, the farmers, why that whole process changed over. It's only fifty years. Mm -hmm. Like the whole of agriculture. Sorry, it's a bit more now. The whole of agriculture changed in the Green Revolution since World War Two, and like it's fascinating now. I I've met pe older people, the older generation who can remember or they can remember their grandparents who ground grain. They had a kern. And it was like one guy I was chatting about didn't like I talk about grain a lot. Uh, but he was like, oh, like my father is kern there in the back. It's like, so that's what they were doing. They were grinding the grain. And I was like, yeah, because you lose 50 percent of your nutrition within 24 hours of milling your grain. Right. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, we used to mill our grain in our kitchen and then bake with bake it with and get maximum nutrients out of it. Totally. 
And that was probably a diverse population. It was milled on site, baked quickly, and that was a nutritious loaf. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward and you go into a supermarket shelf and you see this white loaf, batch loaf, and it's like, there's so many things different along that line. That yeah. that's I'm trying to grow, I'm growing a heritage wheat that I'd love to see made into bread. Now, I need to find a mill and I need to find a baker and I need to find customers. And I'm not opening a mill. That's one of the things I said. Mm -hmm. Someone else needs to do that because I'm already, I'm already doing enough with the mold thing and the brewing. Um, I was going to say that. So for all your kind of different cereals, I mean, instead of throwing it into kind of the, the kind of global commodity market, like are you trying to find a kind of a shorten that link to the consumer? Yeah, and, and that's the that's the goal. So that's the goal with the wheat is to try and see can we get it into bread making. Now, market is tiny because there are some Irish mills, which is great, but they're complaining that the market is small. So we need to get more bakers to do it. And that's real bread, like that's sourdough baking. That, and once you go into sourdough baking as opposed to commodity bread, suddenly the quality of bread is really important. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you're like, oh, Irish flour isn't great for a commodity system, but change that. Think about not using a sourdough. And they're like, oh, we don't like protein is important, but there's lots of different parameters that make a really good bread. Mm -hmm. And sourdough is finickety and cantankerous and it takes skill. So therefore they're used to dealing with that. Whereas in a commodity system with two people running a massive automated plant, they just want the same. They don't care if it's local or where it comes from. As long as it's the same and there's no red lights in the automated plant, they're happy. Mm -hmm. And we get cheap bread that's got no nutrition in it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, whereas really bread should change from year to year, season to season, grain. And it's, it's an evolving and it's adapting process. And I suppose from the beer side of it, I kind of got exposed to that because I was like, OK, I'm gonna, we're going to brew using our own grain. And that brought in all the intricacies and all the complexity and how to manage that and how to deal with all of that. But now I kind of understand this artisan process, which is different to this mass commodity. Like when I started brewing, all the brewers were like, are you mad? Just buy grain, like just make beer, like sell it, you know, like mm. what's terroir? Do you know, they're like, ah, whatever. But the same people are like, okay, I want to make the best beer possible. What do you use? They're like, oh, Maris Otter. I was like, what is, Maris Otter is a heritage grain. I'm like, okay, so you're just saying that actually if you want to make the best beer, use a heritage grain mm -hmm. that's floor bolted. That's a different process. So, and that's, because in a commodity system, they just want uniformity. Whereas really, I want diversity. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's sort of the goal, basically. Um, so so are, you, are you finding with your beers, kind of like wine, it, does it change from year to year? Because you're, you know, obviously maybe last year was a good year because the the heat wave or do you know is, is the kind of yeah. taste changing and uh, yeah so that's are your sommeliers of beer noticing that I, I don't really know the terminology the, the, there is sommeliers of beer yeah okay um, I'm, I'm not a qualified one no. uh but no yeah the grain does change from year to year now we've had two pretty spot on perfect harvests that we're like actually this year was we were harvesting it below 11% moisture, so, so dry. Um, and actually in the commodity system, you get penalized for it because basically they pay, the drier the grain is, they, they'll pay you more for it because you don't need to dry it and you don't need to truck around water. But past 16% moisture, they don't pay for it. So you're delivering more starch, but they'll pay you the same amount per ton. Mm. Just because now it's very rare i've never seen it and some other farmer said he only saw it in the 70s like but that's but each year is slightly different characteristics we do it we do a lot of different things within like once we 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 grow our own heritage grains with so all our own heritage grains in our base as our base malt in our beers now and and then we'll do lots of other interesting things like barrel aging and it's all mixed fermentation so a lot of the flavor differences happen in our yeast in our culture and our barrels so basically yes our beers are going to be different all the time the goal is to put the year that the grain was produced like wine and say okay this is this year's beer it's a different beer to last year's and that's like i yeah we, i have this discussion with so many people they're used to uniformity and blandness basically and so how many farmers in ireland are doing a kind of a similar direct to kind of farmhouse beer 
Uh, oh, foreign house fear is a whole different thing as well. Oh, like, oh, uh, like direct, you know, doing uh, your kind there's of a couple, short. There's a couple of uh, Ballykill Calvin would grow their own grain and they'd mold it in an inch. Um, and there'd be a couple of others. So it's like, very yeah. niche. Yeah. And we're the niche of the niche, basically, because yeah. we don't, we don't, the grain stays on, on the farm. We mold it ourselves with a wood fired boil system, but it's a wood fired molding system. So we're using our own energy from our coppice with standards native woodlands. And then we brew it on site using our own energy again in a wood fired boil kettle called Mad Max. And then majority of the beers now are actually barrel aged. So that means they take a year to ferment. And again, this is not adding yeast, a single yeast. This is using our own yeast, our own bacteria, our own culture, actually, and um, which is developing over time, basically. So again, diversity, we need diversity in the field because diverse plants have diverse roots that feed the soil, nice things. But also in our beer, we should have diversity, not just a single grain. We put in a bit of oats, a bit of wheat, maybe a bit of rye. But then we also feed, we ferment the beer with multiple yeasts and bacteria again to add more diversity so that's and so just so i under, just so i understand heritage grains are heritage to ireland or to northwest tipperary like how heritage is heritage uh that's another question uh there's ancient grains are really old so that's spelled einkorn emer these ones are like tigers eprates like thousands of years heritage is kind of older and um, not there's kind of a little line sort of around industrial revolution and um, you get the taller straw before the industrial revolution the, the grains were like up to your shoulder super tall and that was to outcompete weeds and um, and we didn't have nitrogen after once industrial revolution or green revolution comes in nitrogen fertilizer we start making the grains shorter and then with that we don't need the height of straw is linked to the size of the root system as we start applying fertilizers, we don't need a big root system because we're putting all the nutrients there. And um, so we don't need to have this ability to have big root systems go out and find nutrients. Um, but equally, that's kind of in a chemical image. Really what we're talking about is, and I always said soil, it's about roots. Roots, plants feed the soil microbes, microbes go and get the nutrients and feed the roots in exchange for the sugar. So it's all about these exudates and it's all about the soil biology. Whereas we've been programmed to think about soil chemistry. What is our chemical analysis? What's there? But it's like roots and roots go and get the chemicals. No, the roots can't move. The roots feed biology. Biology goes and gets the nutrients to do it. Now, if we put lots of chemicals there, we don't need roots to go and do it. So that's it all linked in. So heritage, we're using kind of stuff. There's an Irish heritage variety called Hunter. So that's not super old. Uh, I had some Sprat Archer and Irish Gold Dwarf, and actually I have them growing. They're like turn of the century, so they're super tall straw. So like, yeah, I hope they don't lodge basically. And, but that, there's a little bit of trial and error and figure out which ones are good, which ones work, and which ones work for our system. But in time, and this is where we talk about diversity and populations, I want to, by keep growing these grains and keeping the seed, and seed saving is a very important concept, we can adapt these grains to Northwest Tipperary. Mm. So that in time, if I have Hunter and if I start mixing it with different things, it'll start adapting. So my Hunter will be a little bit different to someone growing it in Cork. The DC, got the DC Hunter, yeah. yeah. Exactly, do you know what I mean? And that's, so what I'm trying to do now is bring, even with one crop is bring diversity into it. So it's not just a single variety, because basically like all of our wheat, all of our maize, we've actually, we, we very little genetic diversity there. So by mm -hmm. going back into heritage, we can get more flavor, bigger root systems and grains that are more adapted to biology. Mm -hmm. All of our modern varieties are adapted to perform well in a highly chemical soil with, with bacterial dominant, no fungi. Whereas going back to older grains that have this biology in the seed that are good to interact with the soil, and have those flavors in the grain so that we then produce that into a flavorsome grain, flavorsome malt, flavorsome beer, and hopefully make some money. Brilliant, excellent. So uh, the other thing that you, you brought up on, um, so by going into conservation agriculture and you're moving more and more away from inputs and the kind of, I suppose, the instability of those prices as well. Have you, um, have you seen, uh, sorry, on one level, it must be very challenging to be an arable farmer with grains 
or is it to be moving away from uh, inputs, chemical um, inputs? Yeah, so it's funny, like a lot of this, like- There's a fear sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of this, like what I did in the brewery, you know, and I got growing the heritage brain, that's on a small area. But as part of that, I kind of started learning about soil and I joined Base Ireland. And that has helped massively in converting pretty much all the farm now to conservation agriculture because I could learn off other farmers. Um, and the importance of that is a farmer teaching farmer. That farmer isn't selling a product. He's just saying, this is how I did it. This is how I stopped being reliant on the drugs, which are fertilizer and tillage and stuff like that. So that's very much, I, I would have been and even still, it's pretty risky and, and it is scary. Like this last spring, we, we, with the price of diesel, the price of inputs, we basically, we bought a drill to do more direct drilling, but we also just changed. We did more, we did more minimum tillage than I, I was planning. I was planning on doing kind of a field, try that, see how it worked and then expand, kind of test it, different tone of water, a little bit of a risk, but not everything. But basically when commodity prices change, but I was like, maybe we should do more of this and, and give this a shot you know mm. and basically we we sold everything and then he was like I hope to god this works I was like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know because there's a week there where you're like yeah okay we put all the seed out we put the fertilizer out like this better work because like mm. you've, you've one chance one time a year to get it right do you know what mm. I mean it's not like in brewing you do a batch wrong you just throw it out you start again you do another brew you, you might lose a day's work or something whereas that's a year's work so yeah. there is huge risk in it and um, and the only way to mitigate that is to learn from other people and learn from other people's mistakes and it, it is cool the people in conservation agriculture are, are willing to share and explain you know and say and that's what in turn i have to do the same thing so when people ask the questions i'm like come see look i'll demo i'll show you this is what it is this is the cover crop this is what i'm learning from because the more we learn from it the better and the crucial difference is, and, and this is the cynicism of agriculture, is everyone is telling us to use lots of plowing. And like, you'll hear it be like, you know, it's ridiculous. People think that you don't, everyone should be able to plow and do everything. And it's like, but they're tied into a system that's selling you products, which is fertilizer, plow parts. There's a whole industry there that makes an awful lot of money. And they're solely driven by yield because any of the people we sell grain to, they're like, you know, I, talk about heritage soon they're like yeah yeah lovely lovely great great story but like you know how many tons are you producing so if they if they drop if we drop producing from three tons to 2.7 tons to the acre or something like that right they have less grain so they have less grain to make money on because they make the margin per ton so mm -hmm. they are always encouraging yield 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 at any cost whereas when you move into conservation agriculture it's more about well what's the profitability what are my input costs versus what I get out? Because mm -hmm. maybe 2.7 tons is more profitable for the farmer. Mm -hmm. If you haven't spent the same amount of diesel, the same amount of parts, the same amount of fertilizer, and you still get 2.7 tons, that, that makes sense. So slowly we've been doing it and we've tried to bring in, the other thing is testing. Like conventional farming, like I, I'm joking about this to people, is like the advisor could be in the pub basically giving you advice because it's like, Put out your fertilizer, plow it, till it, put it out the seed, put out a fungicide, put out this, put out that, and harvest in this date when it's dry. And there you go. Do you know, like, because it's the same prescription every year. Whereas mm -hmm. once you start getting into conservation agriculture and start reducing these inputs, it becomes a lot more complicated. And there's principles, but it becomes more about context and understanding. And it becomes a lot more about the, 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 the brain which makes it stimulating, but challenging, you know? Mm -hmm. And and who's at fault for messing up? The advisor's like, I know nothing about conservation agriculture. That's your fault, Morris. You know, you mm -hmm. listen to the guys in base and decided this is a great idea to go and do. But it's part of the learning though, because then neighbors kind of see a crop has come up and then they say, oh, how'd you do that? It's like, yeah, I didn't plow it. I didn't disc it. I just went in there with a cover crop and, and with a direct drill and planted this cover crop. And they're like, okay, now, okay, that's saving money. I can see that. And it came up the same. What's the... I was like, yeah, and we destroyed less worms because of it. And, you know, those are all little things. That's how these things share. And hopefully some so, people here will listen to it and kind of go, oh, I might try some of this or try and learn. So anecdotally, do you find um, there's that kind of jump off the cliff risk? But amongst your kind of conservation farmers, uh, agricultural farmers, do you find that, um, you know, that the is the success story across the board or is that would that be too kind of rose tinted? Uh, 
there's always challenges, but like farming is a challenging anyway. Like, um, you know, every year is different and weather changes and like sowing dates and like, there's always the same debates, but no, like, and that's conservation, as long as you adopt conservation agriculture, right? So you've got cover crops, you've got crop rotation and you've got reduced tillage. So that's, that's what we're doing basically. Now, I do the order of, I put the cover crops first while I'm still plowing. So that's helping get more so, more worms and you can see the yield benefit. So that's a win, you know, and it justifies the cost of the cover crop seed. Built in a small area, now we've expanded to everything. And that it justified the reason to get a direct drill because now we, we have to till the ground anyway for this new in, in scheme basically. Whereas now we can do a tiny amount of tillage as we put in the seed and we get this great benefit and a yield benefit. And you can see it when we're plowing, you can see the seagulls will follow us when we're plowing after a cover crop because there's worms, there's something for them to eat. Whereas when we were plowing, when there was like 50 years of continuous tillage, seagulls would come, but they'd stop. And you can notice the diesel usage difference. The engine's working harder in compacted soil, which didn't have a cover crop. So that's, it's, to me, I'm always like, you adopt it in small little bits. So that's the cover crop, start doing the cover crops. Now I'm trying to do more crop rotation. And I'm only trying to do minimum tillage after I've put in a break crop of like beans or something good. So that oil seed rape, that's going to have the soil in good condition so that I can go in. I can't get minimum, sorry, we did minimum tillage and we stopped doing it because we had too much barley and we didn't have enough break crops and we didn't have cover crops. So it's kind of a system. If you have the cover crops and your crop rotation, all those bits make sense. And I can see that would I do... Without doing the minimum tillage and all these other bits, the break crop doesn't make financial sense because you're still plowing and you still have the same cost of establishment of the next crop. Whereas I'm like, well, after the beans, I can actually put in a crop with actually really low cost compared to plowing and, and one passing. Like in the minimum tillage that we're doing, we, myself, my dad, my dad was plowing. He loves plowing, good plowing. And I was, I was doing discing for minimum tillage. We burnt 100 liters each in a day. It's a lot of diesel, but I did twice the area. And he was like, huh. So on Sunday, theoretically, I could have a day off and he had to get up on his tractor to go and play to catch up to where I was, mm -hmm. you know? And those are the little bits of savings that you're like, okay, you have to still grow a good crop as in if, if we get too much yield loss, that's a problem. But there, there's ways and, and tools to kind of mitigate it that you just do little bits of it, little bits, try it and 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 see from there so I'm, I'm still early and i've still i've made mistakes and but it's a new set of skills and this is what i kind of say it's like my dad has 50 years experience of plow till so you know like he doesn't get it wrong because he's seen pretty much most weather conditions Very, yeah, most variations. everything yeah whereas now it's like a whole new set of rules and, and how does scary. he feel about you kind of embarking on this solo run <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's uh no he, he likes it he can see it um and because we do little tests and little side by sides he is like in fairness we did a cover crop and it was the first year of the direct drill and uh he was like no no okay for the glow stuff you know we're gonna disc it and put it in so he discs it put it in and we have no flooded regrowth and the stuff i did without disking he was like that won't grow and then it grew and then he was looking at it and he's like oh the stuff where we didn't disc has less barley volunteers than the stuff that we did this. So now we had a tractor running around burning diesel, with, which wasn't positive. In fact, it was negative. So this year we did no disking before our cover crops. Do you know, and that was, he put his hand up in his head. Okay, your base guys were right. I was wrong. Do you know, so that's like, there is, there's learning in it. There's a challenge. It is making it more difficult. Um, but he can see the reason and the logic. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? As in, because like the profits haven't been increasing in farming for the last 20, 30 years, do you know? So it's like, hey, you need to do something different. And to me, this is a way that we can reduce our dependency on inputs, on diesel and on labor, you know, because we had like at one stage, of, you know, three of us, you know, three tractors all running, burning diesel parts, everything. Whereas this is a method of using more of your brain and less inputs and hopefully maintaining yield at a at a good rate, do you know? Mm -hmm.
so he, he can see it but there's plenty of challenges and I did get a weeds wrong that and he was like I told you so and it's like yeah, in fairness, yeah that's... <laughs> he gets to say it once just once. yeah yeah oh yeah I wouldn't say it'll be once it'll be a couple more times by the time yeah, yeah. um I suppose it's kind of like you say there's there's a massive industry behind kind of high yields and stuff there's there's probably a lot a, a huge culture now and peer pressure to stay on one kind of trajectory especially when your advisors like in in your world and and the base world in general do you find that the, are there many farm advisors out there supporting conservation agriculture uh there's a couple of them yeah um and they they're coming out and and a huge problem for them and and it's a huge problem even in the likes of Chagas and stuff Chagas just this last year had got a no-till drill so basically they said, oh, we don't know that it works. There's plenty of farmers who know that it work and have the year, like some of them probably about 15 years experience now. But that's, that's knowledge and a whole new set of things. So the advisors are shy because they're like, if I'm advising you and you get it wrong, you're going to come back to me and say, you, you got it wrong. Mm. I, I didn't get the yield because you told me to do this. And there's more complexity to it. So even the same with Chagas, now they have a no-till drill. Now they can do more research on it. But oh yeah, farmers will say to me, they're like, I did a test. I dissed one part of the field and I plowed the other and the plowed bit yielded better. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But like, that's probably barley into barley, you know. And what did you expect? You got more air and you got more stuff into that. You know, this, this takes about four or five years to get your soil carbon up. Once you get your soil carbon up, you got more worms, you got more biology, you got all of these other things. Now you can earn the right to be a really lazy farmer and just put a disc drill and just put seed in the ground and it grows mm -hmm. and it is great but there is a long transition process of relearning I need to relearn how to do all of this and I need to get my soils right and do all of the rotation to improve things be careful compaction and all these other stuff so I think there are advisors but it's complicated and and they're not prepared to like their insurance companies would definitely not be happy if they're like oh you're advising farmers to change wholeheartedly <laughs> into something and you're taking the risk for it sorry yeah. so a lot of it and i think it's 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 a lot more about agency as well actually mm -hmm. it's about farmers get not stop being dependent on someone else to tell you what to do mm -hmm. learn yourself like you know you know you should know your farm you should know soil conditions you shouldn't be ringing an advisor of somewhere else to tell you is it the right time to spread fertilizer is it the right no is your soil dry is it warm is it ready is our things growing and that's what i really find cool about it is it's it's more farmers taking control of their own destiny again do you know where yeah. the, the merchant selling you stuff isn't as important anymore you're like yeah listen that's great but yeah. do you know and, and they're scared about it because the less people and the more this spreads the less parts the less in, inputs the more people are saying, you know, don't be listening to that Morris lad. Those base lads are crazy. They don't work. <laughs> just you know, if anyone doesn't, yeah, it just in case people don't know, Base Ireland is biological agricultural something, was it something SE? Environment. Uh, but it's baseireland.ie, I think. And uh, it's a membership group of farmers, supporting farmers in biological agriculture. So if, uh, it's free for anyone to check out and uh, connect with. And as yeah, uh, as Mara says, it's it they're not trying to sell you anything, <laughs> and uh, yeah. they're just trying to support each other. And but I think what well, the big thing that I've also kind of heard from you as well, it's it's very farm to farm, con like the context. You can pick up a bit of advice, but you've kind of got to know your own land as well and your own biology and what's needed for your own soil. Yeah, so and, and your own head as well. Like that's the you know it it and it's about that teaching of you know what's thinking. going on. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, the most important thing. Morris, you also have a flock of sheep. How important is that to your kind of whole system, your farming system? Uh, when I messed up and I had way too much cover crop debris on the top, very important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look, we're we're northwest Tipperary, close to Loch Derg, and we have lots of limestone very close to the, to the surface. So some fields aren't suitable for crops, basically, um, and are grazing. So that's, and actually, getting the sheep into the tillage ground that's that livestock integration in terms of grazing cover crops because that's i had a massive cover crop i was really proud of it it fed a massive amount of birds and everything but actually it went to seed which is my problem with regeneration but anyway mm. people told me be careful of it i didn't listen i did it and now i would say lads be careful of mustard in this context 
it's great in certain contexts, but don't leave it too long and it goes to seeds and it comes up in your oil seed rate. But anyway, that's that. <laughs> you live in uh, the other one is farmers sharing mistakes as well. You know, that's yeah. that's, that's what good. people you need you need to learn from that stuff. Um, and yeah. the sheep are very important, raising cover crops and getting that integration, breaking down that material because I had too much material in one thing and basically it was blocking up. So then I needed a disc to kind of cut up this material. And then I was like burning diesel to something that I tried to, you know, my dad is like, should have just played it. I was like, I know, but I didn't read. So actually, and it's the simplest thing. You could mechanically chop it up or you could get animals to graze it and mm -hmm. chop it up for you and turn it into manure, you know, and that's. Feeds um, back into it. Yeah, feeds back into the system. So no, I, I think animals should always be part of a system. And it's sort of my view on the, now, some people will say, you know, you can do sustainable agriculture without animals. Yes, but actually in a good mixed farm, we need more mixed farms, you know, and more animal integration into systems. Maybe they don't have to be your animals. Maybe you can tie up with a sheep farmer or a, a cattle farmer to graze off the cover crops at the right time of year, not cause too much compaction, just the right amount of grazing. And then that's beneficial to you as a tillage farmer. Like mm. that's, so that that's ultimately like, to do crops well, I think you do need animals at the same at the same time. So you also have quite a lot of um, biodiversity on your land. And I mean, you have 20 acres of woodland alone, as well as kind of water courses and, and ponds and stuff like that. Um, how does that benefit? Does it, does it benefit your uh, farming system, your product? Uh, or is it just a nice drought, place to live? <laughs> it's, it's there because it's nice. Um, yeah. It, it does have benefits. You can see it in those severe droughts and um, some of those flocks of dairy cows suffering in, in the heat. Having a few big tall trees that animals can tuck in under, under serious heat is useful. Um, and actually there's a very cool thing on your ditches. Depending on the direction of the ditch, it may not actually cause a big yield benefit. On the south, sorry, on the east-west, okay, you do have a shade that will affect your yield, but on the other directions, it doesn't necessarily affect your yield, which is kind of cool. Mm. Um, but no, we have woodlands and we've always had, they've always been there, they're just native woodlands, but I use them actually within our system in terms of coppers with standards. So we, because we're a wood-fired bolting system and brewing system, and we heat our house with wood as well, so we harvest little pockets of that every year, to feed for biomass for energy. So instead of ancient sunshine of oil and gas, we're, we're using our biomass. So, and because it's coppice with standards, we're not importing and replanting, and you're just giving the tree a haircut. All the native ones, as you cut them, they will coppice and put out new shoots. So you're not living roots, you're not killing the place. It's not World War I where you bulldoze everything and take out the Sitka spruce and send it off to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. We're chopping it down, using it on the farm and returning that ash and actually biochar is one of my interests as well. So tie the woodlands into making biochar to tie that back into our tillage ground. That would be cool. Brilliant. Sounds like you, you've got a busy uh, work day. Come here, I'm just going to go to some uh, questions from the crowd here. Um, Sean Kelly's asked, what do you think about hemp? Uh, hemp is cool. You can use it for lots of things. Um, it, I did consider it actually. Um, it, it's kind of a little bit restricted. It is quite late to establish, and I won't don't want to have bare soil over winter. So if it's very late harvesting, that'd be tricky. Uh, mm. it, it's it's on my radar to possibly try at some point. Sorry, it's a C four plant, so it's very efficient when it's growing. The problem is in the winter. I don't want bare soil with no living roots, not mm -hmm. feeding soil biology. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Sean has also asked, what do you think about using glyphosate in no till? farming this is how i explain this this is it's about religion catholic and protestant to be organic you plow and to be no-till you use roundup it, it depends on a healthy soil i roundup and then plowing is you're doing two bam bam like you're killing soil biology you're killing worms that's a big problem what they say and i'm going to toy with a little bit of organic as well hopefully is if you have a very healthy soil with very good soil biology, that can wipe out the, the Roundup very quickly. Um, but if you have a very unhealthy soil and you're putting Roundup out, I don't think that's a happy place for the soil, you know? Mm -hmm. Claire Lyons has said, I um, don't know if it was covered already, but has uh, Morris planted or created areas of wildlife? If so, what did he plant? 
Uh, I am trying not to import um, genetics onto the farm as much as possible. So we use our own yeast in the brewery now. Uh, and this is because we imported ash dye back into Ireland. Who was at fault? The customers, because we bought cheap ash and the suppliers and the department didn't inspect the ash dye back coming in. So I'm trying to let our own native trees. Now, I need to let the trees get old enough to produce seed, but then the seed will grow down. We did actually plant the Harris Corners. So we have some Irish Scots pine growing actually on the farm. So we will try and touch up in places, get some nice trees and get some interesting. Uh, Irish seed savers have the heritage Irish apples, that's cool. Um, but trying to get more diversity, we have alum as well. So I want to leave the alum. It's kind of an understory in our hedgerows and woodlands, but I want to let them develop into proper trees because in the next 300 years, they'll develop resistance if we give them space. If we try and kill them, you know, because it won't produce a massive big tree, it produces lovely timber for us. So it's not a big problem. You know, it, it grows and it dies and it grows again, but it cops us really well. And um, so I'm trying to use as much of our own genetics as possible. Same with our own barley. We should have our own genetics on our farm. Home Saints Eve. Okay. Tracy McCarthy's asked, where do you source your heritage grains from? Is that, that kind of answer? Uh, that's will, uh, no. Yeah, but you have to get some the seed banks and you have to sign these legal agreements that you're not to share them because I would threaten food production in Europe because guess who wrote those regulations? Tree, one of the tree seed companies that uh, maybe lobbied. <laughs> tree seed companies own all the genetics of all the staple foods in the world, mm. you know. And who developed these grains? Like thousands of years this has been developing. Like we shouldn't be owning it by a company. It should be, but anyway, we've designed these agreements so I can't share them freely willy-nilly, which is really annoying. But you know, I can keep them on the farm and I can keep my own home safe seed. I don't need to pay royalties from them because who owns them? The Irish people, the heritage. That's what I freaking love. They are high, low yielding. Tall straw, there's a lot of painful, annoying bits of them, but the flavor, and I don't have to pay royalties, makes me happy every year. <laughs> Fair enough. But it's okay. also keeping them out of the seed bank and into living culture. I can get them into a living, into a product that people will pay for. Now they're not a museum piece. This is a living bit of genetic diversity here, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, Claire Lance has said there was a great session on heritage grains at the Oxford Rail Farming two years back. Sean Kelly's asked, what, uh, what do you think about using human urine as fertilizer? Uh, it's a big issue in that we as a society need to realize that, you know, we're all talking about circular economy. There is stuff and there's human sewerage and urine going out into the sea and being lost. And then we're complaining about fertilizer usage. We should be recycling all of our nutrients as much as possible. The problem with human stuff is that with cows, it's very controlled what you put into a cow. With a human, it's not. And there's all sorts of stuff that humans ingest that people aren't sure about. But no, it should be going into an anaerobic digester. It may not necessarily go onto a human crop, but yeah, urine is really high in nitrogen. It should be used as a fertilizer. Like that's like we're talking circularity, it has to, you know, but that's, it needs a sensible conversation about it. But. Mm -hmm. You're really getting some real quick fire questions, Morris. <laughs> Do you know everything about everything? Um, Colin McLaughlin, Morris, um, could you make any profit from sheep if you didn't have subsidies? Uh, well, yeah, I don't think there's a massive payment per yo anymore. No, sheep sheep work because we have grazing and, and because of that, like we can't, you know, some of our fields, like they're actually, they're native uh, or they're natural agroforestry. So, you know, it, no, the sheep make a few bob. They okay. they keep they keep us fit anyway. That's one thing. Yeah. <laughs> they save you money in gym, yeah. gym yeah, memberships. Yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, Sean Kelly has said, uh, "What do you think about agroforestry and uh, vegan farming?" Veganic is that farming. like vegan organic farming? Uh, yeah. Agroforestry is awesome. I'd love to do more of it. Um, and that field that I'm talking about is agroforestry. Like we got deducted for years in cap payments because oh, you got trees in there, it's not productive. The sheep love sitting underneath it, and it's good for wintering the cat you know cows you know we don't we used to put the cows up there and sheep up there for a bit because it's stony like the burn you know and you get a little bit of grazing when you can't get grazing in other places and um, so yeah correct agroforestry i yeah that's in the crazy bunch of ideas i've, I've, en I've enough more sensible ideas to annoy my dad with for a while but <laughs> someday i would like to do more of it and uh, be cool uh, sorry and organic farming vegan yeah veganism 
I, I do think sustainable farming, we do need animals cycling nutrients. I think I just think it's an important part of the process, you know, that mm -hmm. fair enough. I did, like if people say I don't want to eat factory produced food, absolutely. But as in it's the same with the burned meat or like hill sheep. It's like, what else are you going to do with that land? That should actually have a serious premium if you're using an animal as part of an integration to produce good crops. Because yes, crops we can produce a lot more food than animals. Mm -hmm. But that's that's where it it's more complicated. It's not the mm -hmm. cow, it's the how, you know, like that's mm -hmm. the that's the thing. Yeah, and there's obviously a lot of species rich areas that need uh, grazers uh, in many cases. Yeah. Um so I mean, you have a really diverse system and quite a diverse farm. Is it hard work doing what you do? <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, some podcasts are like, you love what you do. And mm. it's like, yeah, you have to love what you do. And it's even like to do it. Um, the way we've done it, it's probably this. I haven't found anyone else in the world who does all the systems all in one thing as one example. Because it's like we produce single source beer, but we grow the grain, mop the grain brew the grain, age it, can it, and ship it out. Um, and that's using our own energy in, in for boiling and for molding. Like that's pretty, yeah, it's very tough. Um, and I'm not necessarily going to recommend it to everyone because you're really going to have to, it, it's it's let me connect a lot of dots that I, I yeah, I love it. But mm. yeah, I wouldn't, it's, it's probably more profitable and easier ways to, uh, to go about your business, you know? <laughs> Come learn and then you can go and do the the, the easier bits of it. Hey, uh, we do grow hops as well. I see. Uh, yeah. We grow hops and we have our own native hops. Sorry, our land raised hops, wild hops. There are hops growing on the farm all the time. Um, and mm -hmm. once we started brewing, I was like, oh, what are these hops? And let's, can we grow them? And people are like, is Ireland not a bad climate for hops? And my answer is, there's climates that it's more profitable to grow hops. And with the advent of capitalism and the global market that means that hops aren't grown in ireland because it's cheaper to grow them somewhere else not that we can't grow them so this, this was a native plant just this was was it native no it came in the church 13th or 14th century but this plant was just growing there between briars gave it some space now it grows i propagate all of it i bought some other hops this plant still like when i propagate off it it kind of outperforms the imported ones so i'm like hmm, maybe it's kind of adapted or something Mm -hmm. and so yeah it hops can do it uh same thing like it's just that the last hop grower he took him out because he used to um it's a lovely interview actually I, I hope i saved it somewhere but like the last grower and there's interviewed about it and uh, i think it's a moss down in kilkenny way and he was like the head brewer from guinness used to call down to me three or four times a year look at the crop discuss the crop discuss the climate the weather how it's going to affect the hops because that would affect how he used those hops in the beer, which was Guinness, which was, you know, the pride mm. and joy of Ireland. Mm. And he said, for the last three years, the accountant came down and is like, can you do it cheaper? Can you do it cheaper? Don't care. Yeah. Don't care. Cheaper. Cheaper. You know, and that's the, that's what I'm trying to disconnect. And that's agroecology. It's one of the kind of, so we're conservation agriculture on the farm. It's like agroecology is a really cool concept because it's like, it's not just all the really cool practice that we can do which might make the, our product, whatever grain we're doing, a little bit more expensive. It's that extra step of connecting with the consumer. And it's like, that like gives me great pride of like brewing a beer and giving it to someone and someone goes, just nice beer, you know? And it's so like- dare I ask the big question, how Irish is Guinness anymore? Like, <laughs> or are you the new Guinness? Is this what we're saying? You're actually the real, uh, I, I the real version. I won't answer that question. You might as well. You can get the. Uh, you yeah. can get my contempt in the. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, it's owned by a multinational, the third largest. Yeah. No, no, but in terms of what more. they import and what they're, you know, what is what's coming from. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it you this way: in terms of craft and craft beer, Sierra Nevada is still considered a craft brewery, and they brew the same quantity as Guinness. Why? It's also about their ethos, what they do. Guinness. Yeah. They're, they're great and they now have this whole buzz about sustainable farming and it's like great i remember the 15 years where you wouldn't buy anything from us because it was cheaper to import it you're you know it's that there's a little bit of uh what do you call yeah, green washing or something yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's, so, that's the market and that's it's going to happen but you know the genuine i yeah do you know what i mean that's that's why i'm like agroecology the real genuine 
sustainable agriculture, you do need to tie into a local system. And that's, you know, to really make it all stack up, you know, because grain is traded on a ton of grain. It's not grain. It's not traded on the nutrient density. It's not traded on, are you doing it sustainably? It's just a ton of grain is a ton of grain. And that's that. Mm -hmm. Meet your minimum specs. And that's that, you know, mm -hmm. whereas hopefully there'll be more producers and the more local breweries start. And this is, I, I say the same to brewers. I'm like, listen, there's probably a tillage farmer somewhere close to you. Should you not be buying that grain? You're saying to customers buy local, you also buy local and that feeds into local economy. And mm -hmm. if that helps what another farmer get out of the commodity system, that's great. And then he can say, do you know, could you pay an extra two euro a grain and I'll put in a really diverse cover crop and I'll make sure the soil is really healthy. And they'll go, yeah, cool. I'll pay you another two quid to um, put in a really nice cover crop. And then you can have that conversation and you have that link. Whereas that, that link is broken in society now that the brewer talks with the farmer and the molster and they say, do you know what? I'd love to do this. Could you do that? Could you enable something? When you have those links, then those things are possible. Whereas like for years, like grain left our farm and that's that. Mm -hmm. Where did it turn up? Who knows? Who cares? You know, just there's the check. Oh, it's actually smaller than last year. Well, you yeah. know, that's the, so that's, that's, uh, that's what I'd be really excited to see is taking more, the ownership back. Yeah. Yeah. Into those local systems. And then it's out of the commodity system. It's still a bit of capitalism in it. Yeah. But you start creating those links and that creates resilience in our own agriculture, you know? And our own society, food. Yeah. Um, just a question here. Do you use any fungicide or pesticides when you're a farm? We use, still use fungicides. We've been toying with, and we've tried some uh, alternatives to it and had some success. So that's that's nice. Uh, mm. Pesticides. No, we've no insecticides for years um, because that's an absolute cod. Like, just, you know, yes, we had aphids and we had BYVD, oh. but like, the more spiders you see, like the better. And that's the more insecticides you use and the more continuous you use them, the more you damage your ecosystem. So we haven't used them in, in donkeys. And the, the merchant will say, oh, it's cheap, throw it in, good insurance. It's not, like you're mm -hmm. going out spraying something in winter when you shouldn't be. Like, no, that's not a that's not a good thing. And you're killing those beneficials. So trying to, fungicides and yeah, healthy plant, a good nutrition, good healthy soil, should have a good healthy plant which shouldn't be attacked by disease as much so mm -hmm. i need to try and get away from the away from the medicine and more towards the nutrients mm -hmm. and and that's it's a scary process though because like you know all the stats say it's like oh you need to use a robust program to do it you know and it's like well yeah but it's probably possible without it so we, we've done it a bit uh, and i might do some organic with a neighbor this year so that'll be none of that stuff so that'll mm. Yeah, I, I, I'll see what my views are next year. <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, Jim, are you, any thoughts on the number of craft breweries in Ireland closing in the past 12 months? Uh, it's a tough game. Um, like that's just the way it is. And the big boys have very deep pockets and they can, you know, they can crush us at any point. Do you know, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. And what does it come down to customers and customers choosing what they, they buy? And that's, uh, it's a cool thing about co-creation and like what the world is that we want to see. Um, and it's like every person who buys a craft beer or buys something local, you're voting for a local economy. Every time you buy something from a multinational, you're voting for a multinational company that can actually say more over as a um, government than what, you know. So that's, you know, the more customers choose local, the more things will happen and the more, you know, and then once those businesses are up and running, then they can tie in with farmers. That's the so it's it. My sort of view on uh, on it is that we're all responsible for the world we live in. Mm -hmm. It's all in our little choices. And it, people will say, "Oh, but I don't have a massive amount of money." Yeah, of course. Like not ever. Not, I don't have deep pockets either. But I'm trying to do my best to try and keep things as local and create those systems that aren't just world market stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. And tell me, uh, and actually Seamus Bradley has just asked, what, just to plug the name of your brews, what are they? Oh, yeah, I'm terrible at marketing. Uh, <laughs> Canvas Brewery. <laughs> Canvas Brewery. Canvas Brewery.com. Uh, we're in a couple of craft beer off licenses. You can buy directly off us in bulk and stuff like that. And do you um, have a few different types of beers or? 
Oh, just one or two. Uh, we don't do um, we don't do standard beers. If you want standard beers, go somewhere else. Basically, um, we do interesting beer using heritage grains. Try and do single source as much as we can. Um, and the idea is canvas. The idea is creativity. And um, this has enabled me. The heritage crops wouldn't work, but for the fact that I'm able to malt them and brew them on the farm myself. So that's allowed me to play and experiment with all these cool things of diversity and heritage and there's some disease resistance and stuff. So each beer is a different beer. Sometimes they'll have the same name and just a different barrel number, depending on what did. But generally, and some will have a similar trend, but you know, if you just want a, a standard stage, buy it somewhere else. You know, if you want something interesting, and to me, that's also kind of a there's a whole thing about consumption and stuff. I kind of chat about conscious consumption. When you drink something that's just a standard beverage, you don't need to think about what you're doing. It's just mm -hmm. duck, duck, duck. that's that's what it is, you know. Like I, there's nothing new about it. Whereas the idea is that because our beers are new and interesting, you have to kind of well, I suggest you smell it, see what it is, what's it on the nose, put it in your mouth, swish it around, then you then you swallow it, you smell it again, then you kind of go, what is this beer? Do I like this beer? What style of beer is it? You know, and it makes you think about what you're doing. And that's like we're in a society where we consume so much, and it's. Most people are advertised trying to say consume, 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 whereas not a great business plan, but I'm like, consume less, just a little bit more quality, maybe a bit more expensive, but just consume less of it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, and have I a like think it. about it, you know? Yeah. That's, that's, so hopefully that's, it's aspirational, babe, maybe, but I, I'd love it if people, when they drink the beer, they have to kind of say, oh, what is style of beer is it? Do I want it? Do I not? You know, because just because it's canvas doesn't mean that you're going to love it. You know what I mean? Because like maybe you don't like sour beer, maybe mm. you don't like fruited beers, maybe you don't like hoppy beers. But we <laughs> you are a terrible them, marketer. So. Okay, stop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, just going back into that argument you were saying about kind of buy less, buy buy quality. I mean, there's a whole, and we won't go into it because we haven't actually got the time. But there is this whole area of the more nutrient dense. The, the better produce the food or you know the grain or whatever, the no, more nutrient dense the the product. And therefore the consumer actually needs less as well. So while it might be a bit more expensive because it comes at premium, instead of it being exclusive and something for people, <clears throat> not for everyone, there is that idea of, well, you actually need a lot less of it. Uh, like, yeah. I, I, I mean, there's, yeah. no, there's and, a lot of research on that. And the and sourdough bread, real, real sourdough bread. And, um, you know, like you, you can't horse through four or five slices of it. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like, oh, I'm actually good after two. And, you know, and that means we're like, I carry a bit of weight. You know, if I was to consume more of that sourdough, consume less of it, get more nutrients while consuming it, that all makes sense. And where it's in these heritage genetics, it's in healthy soil. But the customer and the farmer, like the biggest challenge is like, love it, Morris. But like, where do I sell this? You know, like, I had to cut the supermarket, doesn't give a crap. You know, that's the, you know, so it's like how we can grow this stuff. Like, and I can grow these heritage grains and these populations because I'm my own customer. So I'm like, Mars, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do this. And then I can make it into a beer. And then, yeah, I probably need to improve my marketing to actually get more people to buy my beer. So then I can do more of this crazy stuff in the fields to like tie it all together. But it's, no, I, I would, it's that nutrient density, those secondary metabolites, that's what give you flavor. And I, it doesn't give you the same gut irritation. There's all of these tied on, you know, that makes such, such, the tiny little incremental differences and the biggest problem is that we can't see it when mm -hmm. you see a slice of bread and you see a slice of sourdough they, they draw a bread you know mm -hmm. you have to taste it and, and have a eat it for a few weeks and then you go do you know what i feel better mm -hmm. ah, it's probably because i went to the gym why did you go to the gym because you felt good you, you know and there's all these knock-on effects that would have savage positive for society but and also the amount cheap of bread is cheap bread you know, marketing ploys we have to wade through in order to find the real the real product you know because yeah. you're selling a really good product but i'm sure diageo are trying to sell me oh, using similar grand. words yeah. you know 300 grand of a budget to make a super slick um, yeah. ad it's campaign good. and uh, like people say you're like oh i can make your super slick videos and i'm like my budget is zero yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what i you know because yeah. maybe i'm cynical about marketing but like yeah. that's my yeah i don't 
So yeah, just come, to finish come up. learn and under, understand what, what we do and why we do it, but I, I'm not going to show it down your throat. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Morris, just to finish up, where would you start advising any farmer listening? Uh, what are the first steps they should take when thinking about conservation agriculture? Uh, learn. <laughs> Base Ireland. L learn from other people. Go visit people um, and, and learn from other people's mistakes because they'll tell you them. Um, Maybe not on Twitter, maybe not online, but they'll tell you all the oh, I did this vanity. Um, and podcasts, immerse yourself, like get the concepts, get the concepts behind it. You know, don't and test, test on your farm. Do a small bit, test it, see, learn, and and get that agency that you can then when the sales guy pitches up, you can kind of say, What about this? And they'll won't know. And you know, that education part, that learning, that self self-driven learning that's that's the key to me you know? how many people are in base in ireland like are there people all over ireland like yeah, you know could you possibly to, find another farmer in your area top no matter to bottom, where you are? like there's guys up in the north there's guys in cork and kerry there's a lot of a lot of tillage but it, actually most of them are all mixed and you know and then there's dairy and all sorts so you'll find them like they're the the weird guy in every county or every village you know there's always one guy who's doing no till and everyone's like ah he's mad find that guy and go talk to him and you'll understand why he's not actually that mad it turns out it's just that he doesn't sign up to the other bull yeah. you know brilliant listen morris thanks so much uh for talking to us tonight and thanks so much for what you're you're doing on your land and spreading the good word and uh if anyone misses any of tonight uh, any of tonight's session or would like to share it with anyone else it will be up on our youtube session uh youtube channel sorry by tomorrow afternoon um, join us in two weeks' time. We'll be speaking to Paul McCormack, who is a agri uh, agroforestry beef farmer down in West Cork. Uh, so if you're interested, do register through our website, uh, farmingfornature.ie. Also, we probably at some stage hope to have a farm walk on Morris's land, hopefully coming this summer. So uh, keep your eyes posted on our social media or on our newsletter, and we'll let you know when the farm walks are open for the uh, summer season. Meanwhile, Morris, thanks a million. Thanks for joining us and best of luck with Canvas Bury. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, good folks. Thanks everyone for joining us. Goodbye.